it's a great pleasure to speak to you today and to speak to everybody who is joining us online. Um, a little bit of background on me is available in the, uh, in the booklets and courtesy of Phil. Suffice it to say, I am uh, a member of the American Federation of Asian Research's Board of Directors. Um, we're the leading, I dare to say, US charity that raises funds specifically to invest in the fundamental biology of aging. I have something of a business interest as well because I'm on the scientific advisory board of the Longevity Vision Fund, and my primary interest is in something called cellular senescence. Um, I've won a number of awards in recognition of that work, and I have this kind of rule of thumb, which is the more awards a professor sticks up on their introductory slide, the less likely it is they can do anything useful in a laboratory. Make of that what you will. And in case I have already lost you, this is my talk in, in one slide. Historically, old age and illness have gone together like fish and chips. What I'm really here to tell you today is it doesn't have to be that way for the first time in human history. And the reason it doesn't have to be that way is that we understand enough about how the basic biology of aging works to begin to change things for the better and make real progress in improving later life health. But progress is not a law of nature and challenges remain both for us as scientists, for my clinical colleagues, and for the business community. And I'll walk you through some of those now. In order to understand where we're going, I think it's probably helpful for us to understand where we came from. If you looked at life expectancy at the beginning of the 21st century globally, it's about 31. By the end of that century globally, it was about 70. By the end of this century, at a conservative estimate, it will be 82. And in the middle of this century, old people, that is folk over the age of 65, will outnumber young people under the age of 16 for the first time in our history as a species. And I think that this is a tremendous achievement because every old person is a baby who didn't die. So you're either a fan of old people or a fan of dead babies. And I'm reasonably sure I know which horn of that particular dilemma I tend to plump for. But this should not allow us to lose sight of the diversity of older people. This is some data I'm very fond of from a company called Wise Branding. About 20% of older people look like a better version of me, actually. They're middle or upper middle class, they're in good health, their major worries are their gym, their wine club, and keeping up to date. Okay? But at the other end of the scale are a group that Wise Branding called the bored and depressed. Former manual workers, dependent on state pension, multiple chronic illnesses, multiply medicated, socially isolated, and the UK's largest watchers of daytime television. And having watched some daytime television, I can understand why they are both bored and depressed. Okay? The key thing that separates these two groups, one so rich, so healthy, and so happy that they should be giving me a leg up, and the other group, much less so, is their health status. Health is a key determinant of happiness. Poor health costs money and causes lots of good old-fashioned misery, a word we don't use very much. And it doesn't have to be this way now. As long as there have been people, we've known that age dramatically increases your vulnerability to disease and impairment. Everyone knows this. We didn't know why. We now know enough about the physiology of aging to extend healthy lifespan. Important breakthroughs are being made by some of my colleagues here today and others around the world. And these are happening now. Transformative things can be envisaged as happening later if we have the courage to act boldly. And the reason I am so certain is that we have a new understanding of the fundamentals of what keeps organisms healthy in later life. It turns out that the mechanisms that maintain health are shared across different species, from flies to worms to mice to us. And this gives rise to a conception 
of later life illness and impairment that we call geroscience, which is basically that there are a few health maintenance mechanisms, you can call them aging mechanisms if you prefer, that act to keep us healthy, problems start when they start to fail. These are responsible for the things that we have chosen as a species to label the diseases of aging, things like cognitive impairment, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, the things we think of as natural changes, gray hair and wrinkles, and the things we find so damn hard to quantify but are still nonetheless both troubling or lethal, like immunosenescence. And the reason that this is such a hopeful slide is that it holds forth the potential to be able to target multiple diseases and impairments in a single hit by targeting some of these health maintenance mechanisms. You'll probably see variants of this slide quite a lot because none of us have the ability to draw quite as well as the artist who did this. I'm going to focus on a couple of these health maintenance mechanisms very briefly on cellular senescence and dysregulated nutrient signaling. And I'm going to try and show you some snippets of why we know they're real mechanisms that work. One of the things that is very clear is, from the first of the pioneering work of Michael Klass in the 1980s, is that mutations in the pathways that allow cells to sense nutrients result in longer-lived, healthier animals. They are long-lived because they're healthy. There is a drug called rapamycin that interferes with the same pathways. If you give that drug to otherwise normal mice, you see extended lifespan. And again, like the mutants, these animals are living much longer because they're much healthier. And drugs like rapamycin have the potential to be beneficial in a wide range of human indications. And in fact, it could be said that the first human trial based on a gerasarens paradigm was carried out quite a few years ago now with this paper from Joan Manick and her co-workers. I think it's pretty timely and somewhat overlooked that a brief treatment, eight weeks with a low dose of a drug that is licensed, improve the vaccination responsiveness of otherwise unresponsive older people to flu vaccines by about 20% and provided them with protection against multiple strains of flu. Improvements to the immune system of older people, I think, is something everybody here now realizes we sorely need. But one of the things I do want to sound is a note of caution. We are not selling panaceas. The same drug when used in trials to try and enhance resistance to respiratory infections rather underperformed. And so I think what we will be moving into is a period of selecting which drug for which patients at which time is going to be most beneficial. In other words, the whole messy business of being good doctors and scientists. And I see this as an opportunity, not a challenge because that means there are multiple opportunities for people to make the necessary developments that are needed. Okay, dealing with other aspects of immune function, you don't need to pull drugs like rapamycin out of the pharmacy to deal with them. One of the more serious events that can happen to older people who are previously healthy is to fracture a hip. It's very, very bad news. And Part of the reason for this is 40% of previously healthy older people with hip fractures will get severe bacterial infections. And this is some work that Professor Janice, Janet Lords talk later on. It's clear that the reason this occurs is because these older people are less able to make an immune activating hormone called DHEAS, but they're still able to make lots and lots of immune suppressive hormones like cortisol which are activated by physiological or psychological stress. So if you snap a bone, your cortisol level goes shooting up, DHEAS cannot move up to compensate, and you self-immunosuppress. And it is possible to overcome this by a variety of routes in some patient groups. The other area that I said I would talk about, because it's very close to my heart, are, is that of senescent cells. And my colleague, Professor Kirkland, will talk about that, I believe, straight after me. Senescent cells, in essence, are simply cells that should be able to divide, but no longer can do so 
And as a consequence of that loss of divisional capacity, they start to develop behaviors that are effectively poisonous to the body. For many years, it was postulated that the gradual accumulation of senescent cells caused aging and contributed to age-related disease. Jim was one of the first people to demonstrate that removing senescent cells, real animals, improves health. Uh, this is my favorite cartoon of a huge amount of data from his lab, which is simply looking at wheel running in animals that have had their senescent cells removed in later life compared to their litter mates that are equally old but are still full of them. These animals will run about twice as far and twice as fast as their senescent cell-loaded counterparts. And if you scale that up somewhat fancifully to older people, it's the difference between having to sell your home, move into a care home, have your world contract around you, and remain living independently where you want to, jogging down to get the paper in the morning, and wishing the young people would get out the way because you've got places to go. Okay, I think that is something that's well worth aiming for. And as Jim will tell you, the first attempts to remove senescent cells in people are already happening. Um, to say one word for myself, since it is my talk at the end of the day, another route that might be useful, rather than simply removing senescent cells, is to reverse the senescent state, something we published on a couple of years ago. So the usual inevitable, it's not pausing because I'm boasting, it's pausing because the slide clicker won't move on. Okay. One of the most useful things that um, we can possibly do is use an old drug for new purposes. And the reason that's so useful is drug development costs sums of money too large to have meaning for the average person. And the human race only has about 1,200 drugs in total. And that includes old stalwarts like aspirin and morphine. And one particularly interesting candidate that my colleague Neil Barsley will talk about is called metformin. Originally derived from a natural product called gallagreen, which is found in goat true, which is a traditional herbal remedy for diabetes, it was used as an anti-diabetic drug. It's what some of us would refer to as a classic dirty drug. It, it does lower blood glucose, but it interacts with a lot of other different pathways as well. And this gives rise to some very interesting effects. Perhaps the most interesting effect from the point of view of this audience is that there is a reasonably solid body of data that shows that metformin improves healthy lifespan in mice, and there's some evidence it does the same thing in rodents. And this has given rise to what I see as one of the most important things that's going on in longevity research right now. It addresses a fundamental question that is best summed up simply as, if you had a drug that would extend human life for 10 years, how would you know? You can't do a drug trial on people for 10 years and see who, who lives and who dies. It's simply not possible. But what Nir and Jim Kirkland were able to reason through is basically this, and I am simply introducing and simplifying for effect. The time at which you develop your first age-related impairment is very variable from one person to another, but the time from first pathology to second pathology is tight. It's about 18 to 24 months. So any compound that works in any way to slow the aging process down or improve your health maintenance mechanisms will lengthen the time from first pathology to second pathology. This is what makes this trial design, which is unique, so crucially important. And if it can be carried out, TAME will show us whether human aging can be targeted and whether we can extend health span in real people and which people we can extend it in. It will allow the Food and Drug Administration in the United States to license indications for preventing aging, which will be a huge boost to the industry. And it will allow the entire sector to move forward with what I see as the next generation set of geroscience therapies. We are at the beginnings of bringing things to the clinic. 
okay? In much the same way that penicillin was the first antibiotic. The fact you had penicillin didn't mean that the problem of bacterial infections was a done deal. All that it's required to roll TAME forward is about $10 million a year for about five or six years. And having given the telephone number sums that Phil was putting up, this should be pocket change, so I'll be collecting it from you on the way out, if, if that's okay. Unfortunately, within the context of the field, it isn't. This is not an eyesight test, by the way. But there is a small prize if you can spot the UK spend on the biology of aging. Okay? And I think it's fair to say that we are not swimming in money here. And TAME will not fund itself. Come on. Come on. What on earth has happened to my slides? I'm clearly going to have the, uh, the glitch for this. Come on. Hello, AV. This is it. The, the research count. Oh, yeah, that's the research councils. They've just pulled my presentation. Okay. If I don't see you again, you know, you'll know what happened to me. Ah, excellent. It's back. And I will very briefly deal with one of the problems that comes up in, in pub talk, which is the fear of success. You know, uh, I, it's summed up for me in a joke. I was in a pub in Brighton. And I heard two gentlemen speaking at the bar, and one man said to the other, he said, you know, he said, I don't know. One minute, they said, the government say we're all living too long and they can't afford the pensions. And then they say we're all dying too early because we eat too many pies. Yes, yeah, said the other, but I just wish they'd make up their minds myself. And that somehow beautifully sums up the dilemma. And what I want to show you is that it's a false one. This is top bar of the situation today, all right? Um, where the red is ill health. We spend the last five, ten years in ill health. Using the, the techniques I've outlined, we'll get one of two things in people. We will either compress that period of ill health while keeping the lifespan the same, or we will extend the healthy lifespan period and keep the period of ill health the same. The reason I say that is both of those scenarios occur in experimental animals. What we will not get is the scenario that politicians worry about, where you will add 15 years to lifespan, 14 and a half years of which is spent with arthritis. That is simply not going to happen. And as Phil has shown you, it isn't just older people personally who will benefit, although for me that would be reason enough. There is a massive societal benefit to attacking the problems of aging at their root. This is a more modest model of what could happen if we were able to translate modest improvements in health span that we see into the, from the, in the lab into the clinic. The US healthcare system saves trillions of dollars even after it has paid the entitlements due to older people. How much is $4 trillion? Well, enough to give everybody on Earth clean drinking water for 30 years. And if we don't attack the problems of ill health, this is money that we will have to spend on looking after older people, and it's money we cannot spend on anything else. And so what then do we need next? As a result of global consultations, it's clear that a concerted effort is necessary to deal with the log jams between the lab, company, and clinic. And many of my colleagues around the world see TAME as key to this. We need to have an enabling environment with more meetings like this and more different perspectives. And because aging is a global issue, people who agree on absolutely nothing else agree that back pain in old age is bad. And if we can't get global action as a species on aging, I find it highly unlikely we'll be able to get global action on anything else. And as a leading charity, AFAR is leading on this. We welcome other partners. Please stick around to the afternoon to find some more, find out some more at our AFAR think tank. And that, as they say, is quite enough from me. And I will hand over to my colleagues. Thank you for listening.